Sports News. Hello and welcome back to the show. This is another Sofa Sports Media production brought to you by Loserpool.com, a fantastic new betting game in which you pick the loser. Head over to Loserpool.com for more information and your chance to win a thousand pounds. All you need to do is sign up, pick your losers, and there you go. You're in with a shout. It's also free to play. So if you don't get involved, you're missing out. And I'm not sure why you'd want to do a thing like that. Boy, have we got a special interview lined up for you guys today. So kick back, have a seat, relax and enjoy. I'm Martin Tyler and you're listening to Harry Simeon. My guest today is a very special one. It's none other than football commentator Sam Matterface. Absolutely thrilled to have you on the show, mate. How are you? Good, thank you, Harry. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Keeping busy, you know how it is. Uh, Good. But can't complain. Exactly, exactly. Sam, um, you know, you are without question one of the most renowned and, and the best football commentators around at the moment. Um, you know, you're somebody that I look up to as somebody obviously looking to break into the industry as well myself. Um, you know, I, I love speaking to people like yourself and, and finding out how it all began. What was your sort of career path and did you always want to be a football commentator? Uh, you're very kind. Um, we're lucky at the moment, I think, because there's so many different outlets that do football and so many great commentators that, uh, you know, it's nice that you mentioned uh, that uh, I could even live amongst them. It's great. And I'm very lucky to do the job that I do. Got to be honest with you. It's it is not really a job, is it? I get to go and watch football on a weekly basis. But yeah, it didn't, it wasn't always like that. I mean, a bit like you, I was trying to break into the industry and I was doing anything that I could to, to try and do that. I mean, you do you your podcast now and you've got quite a few of those going on and I think that I suppose when I was a, a, a kid it was it was hospital radio it was volunteering to make the tea at the local commercial radio station it was sl- schlepping off to Russia Olympic versus Thamesmead Town on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon for BBC Radio Ken and trying to do reports into the bottom of a mobile phone because I was one of the only reporters that, that had one but I had it because I was working at a company where They'd given me a mobile, but it was just, <laughs> it was different. It was, it was a different way of doing it. But I suppose the, 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 in, in, the similarities are if you graft and you just get experience, um, and that's what I did, and you keep doing that for long enough, eventually someone might pay you a small amount of money to actually do it for work. And then you go from there, really. Absolutely, absolutely. And was you ever into anything else in terms of like journalism? Was you into writing at all? Or was it always going to be radio for you? Always going to be commentary? Well, actually, I started the first work experience placement I ever did was on a newspaper, a national newspaper, the Today newspaper. That was certainly uh, what I wanted to go into at that point. I I didn't have a a, a specific. I was told not to be specific and not to hone in on sport and not to hone in on radio or TV, uh, just do stuff in the media. And I did that and uh, I did loads of different things. So I did. Yeah, I did. Worked on the sports desk at the Today newspaper. Des Kelly was there at the time. Um, and I did um, radio, some uh, other bits and pieces. I just did it whatever anyone would allow me to do to get involved in sort of the industry as it was then. Absolutely, absolutely. And like you said, hard work and graft normally pays off. So, you know, it's all about that at this stage, isn't it? Um, particularly for somebody like myself. Now, Sam, you, you commentate for TalkSport, listen to you on there regularly. You commentate for ITV as well, um, you know, What's been the highlight of your career so far? Because I know you, you must have had some incredible experiences. And like you said, watching football and talking about football for a living is, is the dream for, for lots of people. You know, can you narrow down to, to one highlight in your career? Or? Do you know what? I, I can't. And because every time I, I'll say it, I'll say, I'll say probably 2012 being at the uh, Champions League final and and doing that game and then going off to do the European Championships in 2012 and watching Spain win that in, in the Olympic Stadium in Kiev was, was a great moment, a great couple of months of watching good football. Um, and the 2012 Champions League final when Chelsea won, it wasn't a great f- final in terms of football, but it was a great moment. But And it had just come after the Aguero-Manchester City last-minute goal against QPR. Yes. So I suppose <laughs> that sweep of like three months was quite impressive to see Spain lift the the European Championship title after winning the World Cup. I watched Chelsea win the Champions League and watched Manchester City win it in that dramatic circumstance. I suppose that was a golden summer, really. But um, then something else had come up and someone will remind me that I was watching a different game um, 
and I'll go, oh, God, yeah, that was the best game I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's really difficult. And, and do you know what? The other day I was asking, so, talking to someone about this and another game came into my head and I can't remember what it was now. It was that good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do probably around about 130 games a season, a year, really. And But my season usually runs from the very beginning of August, late July to the very beginning of the next July. So it goes for on for a very long time. So I'm usually doing a game every sort of two or three days, I think. And when you've seen so many games, it's very hard to, especially at my age, to recall everything. Uh, but I'm lucky. I'm just so lucky to see so many good football matches. And I love it. I love Brighton versus Newcastle that I did a couple of weekends ago. And even though it was awful for the first 45 <laughs> minutes, I loved watching... I love watching games that are 3-3 three, three and 4-4, four, four, but I also equally love it. I love watching Everton versus Manchester United the other week when Everton beat them 4-0 because it was just a, it was a great story more than anything else. And there was some great football in it, but it was a great story. And being amongst those brilliant stories, I was with Henry Winter a few weeks ago, and he's a great journalist, Henry. And he was talking about, you know, how some people would say to him, you know, why would you want to go into sports journalism? Why would you want to follow footballers around and talk to footballers all the time? And he said, because there's so much, there's so many human interest stories in those, in those footballers. They're, they're, they're people and they've got backgrounds and they've got brilliant sort of narratives about their life. And the fact that we get to, to listen to those and build those and be a part of those, I think is brilliant. Because it is, it's, 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 there's a lot of football in there. There's a lot of great sort of tactical analysis that goes on. But some of the best things you hear uh, are stories. Absolutely. And you know what? We were lucky enough uh, around about six, seven months ago now on this show to talk to Martin Tyler, um, who is yeah. another obviously well-renowned commentator. And, you know, he... he He's the, the doyen. He's the, <laughs> yeah. he's, the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the number one, two and three. That's it. I mean, he shared his experiences with us and how he broke into it. And he was talking about how, you know, he's kind of living the dream and really enjoying it. But one thing he did say as well, and I wanted to ask you this question, if you've experienced this as well. And I've done lots of demos and I know a demo is not the same thing, but there's been lots of moments where I've gone back after and thought, could I have maybe done this differently? Could I have maybe emphasized this a little bit more? And then when somebody else listens to it, they said, actually, you know what? You nailed it. But to me, I'm always criticizing myself. Is that something that you go through? Do you ever go through a major moment in a game and think, I could have done it like this, or I could have said it like that, or I missed this, or I missed that? Does that happen to you? Or have you got to the point now where you're so confident in what you're doing and, and comfortable in what you're doing that, you know, you don't really go back and scrutinize yourself as much? I listen to probably every commentary I do. So whether that's in the immediate aftermath or the day afterwards, I'll listen to most of them back to see where I went wrong and where I went right. And most of the time I'll come away think, well, in fact, all the time I'll come away saying this was not good enough. That wasn't good enough. And this particular thing at the moment where I keep listening back and finding the same problem keeps coming up. And I've given myself a talking to about it, but it keeps <laughs> happening. And I'm like, for God's sakes, can you get a grip on this? So there's something particular that I've got my eye on trying to sort out before the end of the season. Which it's just to do with um, geography and ball geography more than anything else, which I think is so important in, in radio commentary yes, in particular. Absolutely. So like, you, you know, and yeah, I, uh, it's irritating me. And I get irritated by a load of stuff that I say. And I, you go back to big moments, talking about that Sergio Aguero moment. It was the worst bit of commentary I've ever done. It was so, it was shockingly bad, shockingly bad. And I hate listening to it. Um, but, you know, you're not going to get, like I said before, if you're doing lo loads of games, I think I've probably done in the nine years I've been at TalkSport, about 1,200 games. Wow. Uh, just on the radio. So if I've done that many on the radio, comment commentary-wise, in nine years, I'm probably going to mess up quite a few. I would have thought. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, though, isn't it? You, you, that's how you get better is by obviously, obviously looking back and scrutinising your own commentary. And, and nine times out of ten, the listener may not always pick up on what you're picking up on. But it's so important to keep progressing, isn't it? And to make sure that you, oh know, yeah, you keep. Like, you never know everything. I mean, I'm 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 not. I'm not old by any stretch of the imagination. I'm still quite a young commentator in my business, I think. Uh, and I'm one of the younger ones that are on the circuit. But at the same time, I've been doing it now for oh, 20 years, probably, uh, regularly. Um, and yet I still don't think I've nailed it. I've, 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 
I've still got loads to learn. I'm learning all the time and I'm learning off great people. The best commentators that we've got at the moment are in their sort of late 50s, early 60s. In Martin's case, he's 73, I think, you know. So our, our, you know, our best commentators are the ones with real experience because they've yeah. got the ability to contextualise. And you have to learn. You have to do the hard yards. So, yeah. I, you know, like I've said to you, I do 130 games a season for Talk Sport. Prior to that, I was doing games, 50 games a year for a local radio station. And then I was doing other bits on the side of that. So, you know, you have to build up and build up and build up and get experience and you learn. And you'll never know everything because you, you can't. But you'll have a much better idea of what is the right thing to say and what's the wrong thing to say. And you would have been in so many different situations if you've got loads more experience. And I'm not saying that young people can't do the job. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying because I'm, I, you know, I was relatively young at one point as well. And I, I, I was given a good job earlier. Well, I worked my way into a good job earlier on because, I, you know, just to have good fortune, really. But learning my experience, my experiences, I made a lot of mistakes down in Portsmouth on a local radio station and I you know, did some half decent stuff as well, but I, le- I made some mistakes down there and I learned from those. And I think, you know, when you've been in those situations and you've experienced, you know, some bad moments and some good moments, you learn from it and you can build from it. Absolutely. Everyone does in there, whatever job you're in, you do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing with commentators, isn't it? That sometimes you're defined by certain moments of commentary yeah. in your career. And some of the, the, the famous commentators, like some of the ones you've mentioned, obviously yourself included, but like Martin Tyler's got certain sound bites that you associate with him. Uh, Peter Drury for me is another fantastic one who I can't get my head around some of the things he says uh, at the end of games, how he gets them so spot on and, and so you know, perfect, but it's, it's all part of learning, isn't it? Uh, Sam, you've been doing dancing on ice this, this year, haven't you? How has that come about? Cause that is something completely different, isn't it? Ah, as all these great things come about, they, they, someone has an emergency and they need someone really quickly. <laughs> they ring me up. They say, can you help us? And I say, no. And they say, please. And I actually got to the point where Katie Rawcliffe was the executive producer and Cloda, uh, they, uh, they, they, they came to meet me at uh, Euston Station one Thursday morning after I've been doing a cup tie in London. And they basically they basically just said I, I was doing it. They didn't, they didn't really give me much choice, really. They sort of press ganged me into it and said, look, we need help. We want you to do it. And I said, uh, I'd do the first one. And it just gone from there. I've been really lucky because that is a really good team and a really good set of people that work on it. I mean, I mentioned Katie and Clode are there who are probably the top light entertainment producers in the country. I mean, they are... They are they are television royalty. They're great, and obviously I work with Philip and Holly, who are television royalty, royalty as well, in yeah. themselves. <laughs> you know, and, and you should see the way they work. It's brilliant, really, and I'm privileged to sit through all their rehearsals. But it's a, you know, it's, it's a great experience. I love it. It's a completely different experience. And again, we talked about you know, dealing with different situations when you're behind the mic and Gemma Collins has launched herself <laughs> onto the ice. You, 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 I don't think much prepares you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. Um, Sam, the, the Premier League season, as you said, you've covered lots of games this season. It's been a very entertaining season, in my opinion. Um, you know, Manchester City and Liverpool, of course, fighting for the title. It's been a, a thrilling title race so far. The, the race for the top four is still well and truly on. I think the relegation thing has kind of settled down a little bit. It looks like... Cardiff will, will be going down now as well but in terms of the title race I, I just want to get your thoughts on on Liverpool in particular and I, I'm not a Liverpool supporter but I admire how well they've done how well they've done to close the gap between themselves and Manchester City and any other year they would have been champions by now surely well that's certainly true I mean the points per game total that both those two teams have amassed is Nothing short of sensational. I think I've I've been pretty consistent on this because a lot of people do like to try and find fault with the fact that Liverpool might come second or that Manchester City might find themselves without a Champions League and only with the League Cup and FA Cup to to show for it. And that's not very fair on Watford, by the way. But you know, they, what if if Manchester City? Someone asked me this the other day. If Manchester City walked away with a cup double, would it be seen as a failure? And I said, no, don't be so ridiculous. These two teams are probably amongst the most consistent and best teams that we've ever seen play Premier League football. Now, there's arguments that can be had all over the place for the quality of the opposition, the quality of the league. I tend to think that you've got you've got quite a few 
big teams, so Tottenham, Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester United, that have severely underperformed in the second half of the season. And I mean severely underperformed. I mean, you look at that. I, mean, I watched the game on Sunday, Manchester United, Chelsea. And Manchester United were the better team for the first half, but couldn't keep up with the tempo of the game, gassed themselves out. Chelsea were better in the second half. But the football from both at times was appalling. It was scrappy. It wasn't... I mean, it looked to me like these two teams, are, uh, one of these two teams is definitely going to be in the Champions League next season. How scary is that? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, there's a lot of work to be done on both sides there. Um, and, you know, uh, Tottenham, have, Tottenham have lost 18 games this season. So if you factor in that, you can all obviously sort of pick holes in the fact that they've amassed Liverpool, Manchester City, so many points. You look at the bottom and Huddersfield and Fulham have been dreadful uh, in terms of the way that they've performed. But And you can then, again, ascribe the totals that Manchester City and, and Liverpool have got to some of that. But ultimately, you have to give one Pep Guardiola for the credit of constructing a team that are so consistent over two seasons that they're going to almost touch 200 points in two years. They may get 198 points over two seasons, which is absolutely unreal. Liverpool have gone from being 20 points back from Manchester City last year to being within one point of them if the season ended now. One point. And they've done that with... They bought a goalkeeper and two central midfielders. Yeah, And both those two central midfielders took six months to get into the team. So it, it's... And they lost Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain for, for almost a Yeah, exactly. A I was year. just going to say that, yeah. They so, spent a, so, so, I mean, it's just been remarkable. And it's we were really lucky to watch it. We're really lucky to see how it unfolds and whether it ends with Liverpool winning the title or Manchester City winning the title. Whoever lifts the trophy deserves a massive round of applause and um, they deserve all the credit in the world. But the person, who's, the person who finishes second also deserves credit for being an absolutely brilliant football team and one of the best we've seen. Absolutely. Um, Sam, just lastly, what have you made of, of sort of the remainder of the teams that are sort of fighting for the top four? Of course, I'm an Arsenal fan. Everybody that listens to this knows that by now. Um, I've not been totally, uh, what's the word? to use here totally convinced by Unai Emery's first season I'm not saying that he's had a bad season by any means but I think that Arsenal are in the position they are in uh, in terms of fighting for the top four because of the circumstances around them more than the fact that they've improved a great deal what do you make of that whole race because of course at one stage United were 11 points behind Arsenal um, and it seemed as though you know they were out of it then it sort of swung again Tottenham have had a bit of a bad run and they're sort of dragged themselves back into the mix when in truth they should have been clear from it all. Chelsea are very inconsistent. Who do you think is going to end up in that top four? Well, Chelsea now should because they've got a three-point gap um, with two to play. So Chelsea should nick that place. Tottenham obviously should as well finish in third position. But Tottenham lost again on Tuesday night and um, they've got a big Champions League semi-final away day to come. They've got not the easiest fixtures in the world, but not the hardest fixtures either. Um, but then it, it doesn't seem to matter, really, does it? I mean, these two teams, these three teams, four teams, uh, have thrown away points that you wouldn't expect them to throw away in the latter exactly. end of the season. Yeah. It's worth pointing out, Chelsea went on a, a fantastic run at the beginning of the season and were very, very good right at the start of the campaign. Manchester United then were absolutely brilliant in that Christmas to uh, March period when they won a lot of games. Um, Tottenham were really good at the first half of the season, awful in the second. Arsenal have had spells, haven't they, where they've gone on and won a lot of games and caught up and closed the gap. What it tells you is is that all four teams below Manchester City and Liverpool are probably just about the same in terms of their ability. You know, um, I I don't know how it's going to end. I mean, Chelsea and Tottenham should get those places, but they might not. You never know. Anything can change over the next couple of weeks because it's been so unpredictable. I think... when you look at the Premier League, I mean, I looked at the Championship. The Championship was supposed to be the most unpredictable league. We go into the final game of the season this weekend and um, nothing is going to change. Everything is as it is yeah. right now. It's done. Uh, a game out. And that doesn't happen very often. It's the worst scenario possible for a broadcaster if you get the final day <laughs> of the season and there's literally nothing on it. Nothing. I mean, West Brom could change places with leads. That's probably about it, really, realistically. Um, whereas in the Premier League, 
it is going to go down to the final day and there's so many different issues are I think obviously Cardiff have got to play Crystal Palace this weekend but if they can win that game even as unlikely as it is on the final day of the season that they could stay up there's still a possibility of that so you know I love the fact that it's there's so much drama in the Premier League this season I love the fact we've got a race for the title I think it you need that every now and you know you can't have one team dominating all the time and I'm pleased that we didn't you know after last year which was literally a procession from <laughs> the end, middle of December it's great that we've got a proper race absolutely Sam one final thing I want to pick your brains on and this has been an ongoing debate on this podcast uh, over the last few weeks has been the the appointment of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer on a permanent basis now in my opinion it should have waited until the end of the season, in my view. Um, what's your view on it? Because I know the form has suffered. I don't necessarily put it down to just that. But were United correct to appoint Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Had he done enough to to secure the job at the period he did? And, and what are your thoughts on it? Is he the right man to take them forward? I, I, I'm i going to check here because I, I, I did the press conference when he got appointed as the manager. Um, and I, I don't know the date of that. Um, I can't remember what it was, which one it was. I think it was, was it before the West Ham game or or was it uh, before the Watford game? I can't remember I which one. I think it was before West Ham, but I could be mistaken. Um, okay, so had they lost two in a row before then? Or, uh, no, it was before the Watford game, wasn't it? I think it was before the Watford game. I think they lost two in a row to Arsenal and Wolves before That's right. they yeah, played you're right. You're right. Uh, Watford. I think... I think and they announced him on the 17th or... No, no, the 19th. Whenever it was. It was in between the Wolves' defeat in the FA Cup and the... It was in the international break. That's when it was. Um, and Wolves had just beaten them in the FA Cup. They'd been knocked out. And they wanted a pep up, so they gave them... You know, Ollie's now the permanent manager. And he beat Watford in, the, in a very lucky game. They were already struggling a little bit. That had just been... They'd had that fantastic win in Paris and they'd had a dramatic win over Southampton where they conceded goals and scored goals. And then they went on a, a, a run where they, I think they, their true sort of character came through. They, 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 they'd, they'd edged through games where they were not very good. Manchester United beat Reading in the FA Cup earlier in the season. It was a dreadful football match and they won it by two goals to nil. And they'd gone away and done some good performances. But let's be honest... The performances at the end of the season and the performances when Jose Mourinho are in charge are probably pretty similar. Yeah, agreed. In the midterm, the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer had um, some good moments, but ultimately, the same players can only do what they can do, and they haven't got a particularly good squad. So, you look at David Moyes, okay, probably the wrong appointment for me, but then they hired. Louis van Gaal, who at one stage in his career was credited with reinventing the way that the game was played. You've got Jose Mourinho, who at one stage in his career was re- was credited with reinventing the game completely and the way it was was played. And then you had, um, you brought in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who is obviously not got management experience of the other two, but is very well versed with Manchester United. And whoever you put in charge it's been pretty similar. You might have had peaks and troughs, but it's been pretty similar. That would suggest to me that the problems run a lot deeper than just the manager and that the playing staff aren't good enough. Yeah, it's a fair assessment. It's it's a fair assessment. I mean, it all points to that, doesn't it, at the end of the day? Me personally, I don't think that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was necessarily the right appointment because I think they could have done with someone with a little bit more experience in in the sense of if they're going to... it kind of doesn't matter, Harry, does it? Because ultimately, if the players aren't good enough and the structure behind the manager isn't good enough, it doesn't matter who you put in there unless you're determined to put those things right first. It's almost irrelevant who's sitting in the chair. It's not because you have to make decisions on the side of the pitch and you have to have a bit of tactical nails. But ultimately, they're not going to win the league anytime soon. No, I agree. They agreed. haven't got the structure behind the manager to recruit the right players. You know, Manchester United have basically just got out their huge amounts of wads of cash and bought the most commercially viable player that is on the market at the one particular time when really what they need to do is to get back to being a sporting institution and construct a team that can challenge to win trophies. That isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to take four chance transfer windows probably. And they need someone in there who's going to be able to to negotiate their way through that. 
agree. I, I guess the angle that I'm coming at it from is, would I trust Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to build that team? And that's where I struggle. That's where I look at it. And I think, yes, I, I totally take everything you've said on board about the structure not being right and, and that it's going to take time to build. But I just don't feel that he has the... And I know it's, it's horrible to say about experience because if you don't give people a chance, how are they going to get experience? But for me, I just feel that this rebuilding job might be a little bit too big for someone like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And that's kind of where I'm on the fence about it. Um, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I wasn't going to say. I was all I was going to say was that he won 14 of his first 17 games in charge, and I think it would be a big job for anyone. I think it's a big job for Jose Mourinho. It was yeah, a big job for Jose Mourinho. Absolutely. And if you're in that situation, then it doesn't. Again, it, it, experience obviously doesn't matter because you had one of the you've had two of the most experienced managers that are, were available at the time, and they couldn't sort it out. So, you know, I mean, obviously, I think desire-wise, they wanted Poch, and they would love to have had Poch, and Poch would build for the next 10 years for them. I think that was ultimately the idea, but I don't think he's available. So, Yeah, absolutely. be interesting to see how that situation, of course, develops. Sam, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. And I know I've taken a little bit more of your time uh, than I said originally. So I do appreciate you staying on. Uh, and thank you so much. And hopefully we can speak again soon. Cheers. That was the brilliant Sam Matterface. A huge thanks to the man himself for taking time out of his busy schedule to join us. It is, of course, much appreciated. Now, if you enjoyed what you just heard, be sure to hit that subscribe button. You can check out our sister shows, The Chronicles of Aguna. In particular, if you're an Arsenal fan, do head over and check that one out. We also have the Simply Serie A show. It's up and running, um, and that's been going for a little while now, roughly on 10 episodes. Uh, it's a brand spanking new show with some fantastic contributors where we cover all things Italian football. Of course, you can find both of those shows on iTunes, on SoundCloud, um, you can find the Chronicles of Aguna on YouTube too. Uh, so do keep your eyes peeled. Follow us on uh, Twitter at Sofa Sports Pod, where we'll be tweeting the links to all of our content over the coming months. So, uh, yeah, we hope to have you back again soon and enjoy.